to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. We'll read our scripture verses 1 through 13 of Luke 4 in just a few moments. <coughs> Last week, we talked about the transfiguration of Jesus on the Mount. Now, Peter had uh, thought that he had arrived. He had had this great mountaintop experience, and he said, Lord, if it pleases you, if it's the right thing to do, let me build a place for you, a place for Moses, a place for Elijah, and we'll just stay up here forever. And the Lord said, no, Peter, you've got to come down off the mountain. There's still work to be done. So most of us at some point in our lives have had, what, have had what's called a mountaintop experience. A time when it seemed that it just couldn't get any better. You and the Lord were, were just right beside each other. The Holy Spirit was just filling you. And all was right with the world. As close as to heaven on earth as it's going to be. And not to be cynical, but what usually happens after a mountaintop experience? A valley experience. Almost always. Often what happens is, is we go from everything being just right, everything feeling like we're just full of the Lord's Holy Spirit, everything is great, to I can't believe how bad things are. Um, <clears throat> And that happens with other areas of our life as well. It's really common with, with young couples who get married, who are, who are young and idealistic. And what happens is, is a great big deal is made out of their wedding, which is, is great. It should be. The whole wedding day, the whole world revolves around the bride and the groom. On that day, they're, they're treated like royalty. The bride gets to wear a beautiful, expensive gown unlike she's ever worn before in her life. When she comes into the room, everybody stands up and honors her. They get to be the center of that of the world for that day. All their friends show up and they do their best to, to help them out. And then after the, the wedding ceremony, they get to go to a great feast of where they are the, the guest of honor. Nobody even eats until they sit down and lift their fork. Now, people share them with gifts compliments and love. The wedding is definitely a mountaintop experience. Now it usually doesn't take very long for that mountaintop experience to get knocked down just a little bit. Sometimes it doesn't even wait till the honeymoon's over. And suddenly the reality of life sets in. They wake up lying next to each other realizing that neither one looks much like a prince or a princess first thing in the morning. They discover that there's nobody there on that day to wait on hand and foot like on the day of their marriage. And within a few months, they're faced with the reality of sacrificing for their mate. Day after day. They quickly come to realize that while marriage is a great and wonderful thing, it's also a lot of work. Now, those type of experiences are not uncommon in our spiritual walk. For years now, Katie has participated in a, a three-day weekend experience called Walk to Emmaus. And you leave on Thursday evening and you go and you spend until Sunday evening. The way I like to describe it is just sitting in God's lap, soaking God up in. Just drawing close to God. And for many people, it's a great awakening time in their life because it puts them in a place where there's no outside interference. Cell phones are, are gone. Watches are gone. There are no clocks available. You can't see. And it's just all day and all evening and then go to bed and you're with the Lord the whole time. Great times of worship and, and I'm kind of an advertisement if you hadn't noticed. If you would like to, if you're more interested, let me know and we'll get you signed up. But it is a great thing. But these people, they go there time after time. I've seen it. They have mountaintop experiences. And they leave that place walking on clouds closer to the Lord than they've ever been. And then that's Sunday. Monday, you get the emails. I got back to work today. Worst day I've ever had. Why is that? 
Well, see, they've been changed, but the world they go back to hadn't changed it. you got to be ready for the valleys of life. Jesus had a similar experience. He's baptized. John baptizes him. The, the, the father announces, you know, this is my son. I love him. And the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. A mountaintop experience for him. After his baptism, Jesus was immediately led into the wilderness to be tempted. And suddenly the mountaintop <coughs> experience was over. And he began to descend into the valley. It's in the time that he's in the valley that we're going to be looking at this morning. There is great value in, in observing Christ at some of the most difficult moments in his life because we can learn a lot that's going to help us when we find ourselves in the valleys and when we're faced with temptation. So let's turn to our scripture, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully, that they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Lest uh, Jesus answered, It says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him <coughs> until an opportune time. This is God's word for all people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So let's look at these temptations. Three different temptations that Satan throws at Jesus. He, he came to Jesus three different times trying to get him to act against the will of God. And I think we'll see that at the heart of each of these temptations, there's a simple question. And that question is, do you trust God or not? Jesus stood firm in the face of these temptations and we're studying his experiences so that we may do the same. Luke tells us that Satan began by tempting Jesus to turn stones around him into bread. Satan baited Jesus, If you are the Son of God, then tell the stone to become bread. Notice how he starts his, his temptation. If you are the Son of God, if you're really who you think you are, if you're really who you say you are, and that's, that's significant because it shows the temptation wasn't really about hunger. It was more a question of whether Jesus was going to trust God. Satan was daring Jesus to rely on his own abilities instead of trusting the Father. And really I think that's at the root of, of all temptation. Satan will use our normal human desires for food, for love, for acceptance, for, for belonging, fulfillment. And he will convince us that we have a need to, to take care of those desires ourselves. Because, you know, God's busy. God doesn't really care about those little things in our life. He'll try to convince us. Satan will try and convince us that God is really out of touch with, with what our desires and wants and needs are. And Jesus recognized it for the lie that it was. And he responded to Satan by quoting Scripture. He said, man does not live by bread alone. It's from the book of Deuteronomy where the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness and they had no food, so God provided food for them. Just enough for that day. And then the next day, just enough for that day. God was reminding them that everything they had come from Him and, and they needed to trust Him to take care of them. The question was, would they be satisfied with what God had provided or would they try and go around Him to make things happen the way that they want? It's the same.
same question that Jesus faced, and it's the same question that we face in temptations. After Satan failed with that first temptation, he regrouped. We don't know if, if he came back at a later time, another day, or if it was immediately after this he began his next temptation. But regardless, Luke tells us that Satan proceeded to tempt Jesus by showing him somehow all the kingdoms of the world at one time. And then he said, if you'll just worship me, all these are mine. I have the authority, I have the power to give them to you. They're mine, and I can give them to you. Now, it might have been possible for Satan to deliver on this promise, but only in the earthly sense. He, he could have given Jesus earthly power, but it would have ended there. Satan was offering Jesus the chance for glorification right now, without having to go to the cross. He was, he was whispering the same lie. You don't have to trust God. God's going to be cruel to you. You know what God's going to have happen? It's going to hurt. It's going to be brutal. And you know what? Satan says it's going to be unnecessary, Jesus. Let me show you a shortcut. And once again, the temptation was, was not about anything other than trying to get Jesus to not trust God's timing and God's overall plan. <coughs> We face temptation in our lives when we are tempted to take shortcuts as well. Satan will tell you that, you know, it's all right to, to pad, to lie on your resume to get ahead of somebody in line for that job. He'll tell you it's all right. Satan will tell you it's all right to overcharge your customers as long as nobody else is going to find out about it. You can get ahead that way. Satan will tell you that it's all right to enjoy a sexual relationship without the hassles of getting married. Satan will tell you that you don't have to work hard if other people don't. Other people exist on government handouts. You can do it too. Lies that Satan will tell you to try and convince you to not trust God's way. The question is, is do we trust God enough? to do things his way, or will we buy into the lies of the devil? Jesus stood firm in resisting this temptation. He knew Satan's shortcut would cost far more than what could be delivered. He knew that nothing Satan could offer would be worth turning his back against the Father. And in other words, Jesus knew that the end did not justify the means. And he once again turned to Scripture for strength. He reminded him that Scripture said, you should worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. And Christ chose to stand with the Father instead of falling for the lies of Satan. And when Satan launched his third attack, he, he changed tactics just a little bit. And he took Jesus to the temple and, and took him up to the highest point of the temple and he quoted scripture to Jesus this time. He quoted him part of the psalm that we read just a few moments ago responsibly. Psalm 91, which said that God would protect the one who trusted him. He said in effect, you know Jesus... God will protect you if you jump off this building. Imagine the impact that if you would jump off this building some 450 feet in the air, and if people saw that God protected you, preventing you so much from just from not even stubbing your toe on a rock when you land, people will surely recognize and, and know who you really are. Jesus responded that the Bible says that we should not put the Lord, our God, to the test. Don't test God. What a good reminder it is for us that Satan can twist Scripture for his ends, for his means. Often Satan will, when we're facing temptation, Satan will whisper a verse out of context to try and get us to act against God's will. Jesus was smart enough to know that Satan was misrepresenting what the whole of Scripture taught. He knew that God said that we should never try and force his hand. He knew that God had created the world with certain rules, certain laws of physics like uh, gravity. <laughs> if I jump off this building, you know, uh, God might do that, but when you do stupid things, stupid things happen to you. If you jump off a building, you're probably going to splat, right? Gravity kicks in. Ignoring those rules and then asking God to save us from, from the effects of breaking those rules is, is putting God to the test, folks. 
And that makes sense to us, and it's common sense when we talk about the context of jumping off a high building. Here's the problem. We wouldn't jump off of a building, would we? And expect God to save us. But we do that very same thing in principle all the time. We test God. We test God when we ask Him to give us health while simultaneously doing things that are detrimental to our health. Overeating, not exercising, smoking, drinking, doing things that are detrimental to our health while we pray, God bless me with health. Or, God, protect my children. Let them grow up and be godly men or godly women while we're not showing them and leading them in that direction. Or asking God, you know, Lord, why is this this way? Why, why? Asking God general questions while we neglect to study His Word to see what He says on the, on the issues at hand. Or asking God, God, guard my mind from sinful thoughts, attitudes, and behaviors while I fill my mind with all the trash that leads me into those temptations. Or God... Bless me with lots of money. Bless me financially while I simultaneously neglect to be a good steward of what you've already given me. We need to trust God enough that we will live the way that He calls us to, the way His Scripture calls us to, or accept the consequences of ignoring those principles and those laws and those commands. So, Jesus withstood all three of the temptations that Satan threw at him. I think it's important for us to know something, or to note something here, is that while Jesus was fully God, he is facing these temptations as fully human. While Jesus was fully God, he was also fully man. It, it would be easier... It's easy for us in our minds to say, well, you know, sure, Jesus could stand up to Satan's face-to-face -face temptations because Jesus was God. But he was facing these temptations as one of us, as me, as you. Jesus didn't exercise his power as God. He faced all these things the same way that we have to face them, as a frail human being. So if Jesus stood firm in the face of, of these temptations in the valley for 40 days, and if like us he really was tempted to sin, what can we learn from his experience? First, we learn that God does not always lead us into situations that are easy, that are comfortable. Notice who it was that led, this, led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. Who was it? The Holy Spirit. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that detail. And Mark even says that Jesus was immediately led into the desert by the Spirit to be tempted. That's significant because it reminds us that just because something is difficult, it doesn't mean it's not something that God is calling us to. We often buy into that idea in American Christianity. We, we seem to think that if God has called us to something, then all the obstacles are going to melt out of the way. The road is going to be paved. There will be no bumps. Everything is just going to be smooth sailing. And when it gets difficult, we think, God must not really want this. That's not what He really called me to do. We face obstacles. Or we face struggles, sometimes because we have ignored God, or sometimes because we have moved from His path, but then sometimes we face difficult times, it's because God is allowing them for some reason to strengthen us, to prepare us for what's ahead. Some trials are just part of the job of growing as a Christian. I often hear people say, usually to someone else who is in a dark place. God will not put more on you than you can bear. I want you to know that that is not entirely biblical. That is not entirely true. 
God wants you to trust Him. God wants you to cast your burdens upon Him, to trust Him. It is true that God will never allow anything befall you that is too big for Him to handle. But I'm telling you right now, if you face the world thinking that God will never put more on me than I can handle, you're going to be crushed at some point. You'll be crushed physically, spiritually, emotionally. You don't need to go there because if you trust God, nothing is too big. Everything is under God's feet. All the things that are too big for me, He can still handle. Second, we need to be reminded that Satan, he likes to run the same plays over and over, just like the Panthers did in the Super Bowl. Run it right up the middle and not go anywhere. Satan likes to use the same plans over and over. Why? Because for him, they have worked over and over. And over. As we read the account of Jesus' temptations, we should be reminded that he faced the same kinds of issues that we face today. As a matter of fact, the writer of the book of Hebrews, he says this, We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he was without sin. He tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way just like we are, but He was without sin. That fact should be exciting to us. That is great news for us, folks, because if Jesus can face them just like we are and He can stand up to the temptations, then that's good news. We can do it too. And if you think about other things in life, we do it. We ask friends and family all the time about something that they have been through. If you hear the diagnosis of cancer, one of the things that you're going to want to find out is you're going to go talk to somebody who's been where you are to see what you can expect. If you're planning on spending a load of money going on vacation, you're going to find somebody who's already been there and done that, and they can give you some tips to, to save you some money and it give you a more pleasurable time on your vacation. If you're facing a marriage meltdown and a possible divorce, you're going to want to talk to somebody who's been there and who survived that, who's, who's held it together and moved on. <coughs> Why do we do that? We do it because their experience, their knowledge, their know-how will, will help us. They, they can tell us about the things they did, what they didn't do the pitfalls to watch out for. And it seems like a no-brainer that when we face temptation, we ought to ask the one who has been there and done that and was successful in standing up and never sinned. We can draw from Christ's experience and apply it to our living when it comes to facing temptation. And third, the key to victory is not so much as having the attitude of, 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 I'm just going to say no to sin, I'm never going to give in to temptation, when the way that we really ought to be living is, what does God tell me to do? How can I please God with my living? We need to start by knowing what God wants us to do, and then do it. If we fix our minds on knowing what God has called us to, and then trying to please God rather than, than, than trying to not fall into temptation, it's going to be easier to avoid sinning in those times of temptation. We need to focus our minds in the right place. So when facing temptation, we need to change the perspective from I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to sin, to I'm going to say yes to God, I'm going to trust God, I'm going to do what God's Word says. You're kind of doing the same thing, but with a different mind's perspective, and you're going to be able to easier face temptation. Now on Ash Wednesday, we spoke at our service on Wednesday about how Lent is a time that we look at our lives and we ask God to show us those things in our lives, in our living, in our actions, in our thoughts that are keeping us from being like Jesus. So practically speaking, there are some things that we should be doing right now that will help us become more like Christ. Jesus used Scripture to battle the devil. We need to know God's Word. 
Jesus knew the importance of taking Scripture as a whole. You can, you can make the Bible say all sorts of things if you divorce passages from their context. You know, you can grab your Bible and you can flip over here and it says, uh, uh, and Judas went out and hanged himself. And then you can flip over here and Jesus says, go and do likewise. <laughs> Is that what Scripture is telling me to do? No. No. Out of context. And I heard, I heard a preacher on the radio this week say it so eloquently. If you take a text out of context, all you're left with is a con. It made sense. Reading a passage in context doesn't just mean that you read that verse in light of that chapter. It means that you interpret everything in light of the whole of Scripture. And in order to be able to do that, guess what you've got to do? You've got to know the whole of Scripture. Little devotionals are great. I have some pop up on my iPad every morning. A little snippet. A little story that goes with it and one little verse that goes with it. And that's just wonderful. That ain't enough. That ain't enough. Get started in reading through a book of the Bible. You don't necessarily have to start in Genesis. Although sometime in your lifetime, I recommend that you read from, as Mark Lowry says, from Genesis to the maps. Read it through. Read it through. Get to know it. But whatever you read, whichever book, whether you read from beginning to end or whether you read here and read there, uh, there's a lot of things that uh, you can do the Bible in a year and it gives you an Old Testament, a psalm, a wisdom book, a gospel, and a letter. And you can read it in about 15 minutes a day. Uh, but whatever you do, when you read it, you need to be thinking of two questions in mind. First one, what does this passage teach me about God? About God's character? About God's will? About God's commands from my life? What does it teach me about God? And then the second thing is, how should this affect the way that I live my life? As you read through the Bible and you start to understand the nature of God, you'll understand how you can better live to please God. And when you're living to please God, you are living in God's will. And when you're in God's will, temptation is easier to defeat. And finally, you, you know, I can remember when I was five or six years old, Mildred Lell, my little Sunday school teacher, I thought she was a hundred years old then, but... You know, I think now she's only 80 something. <laughs> but she said, idle hands are the devil's workshop. And as a six-year-old, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. As a 48-year-old, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. I don't know what Jesus did during his 40 days in the wilderness, but my guess is he didn't just wander around and look at the nice sunsets. He spent a lot of time in prayer. He spent a lot of time focused on God. He spent a lot of time with God so that he could defeat Satan while he walked with Satan. We get into trouble when we begin to fill our time with things that are not godly, things that distract us from God. When we spend time aimlessly wandering around on the internet, we're inviting trouble, folks, because there's some things that pop up that you ought not be looking at. And I'm not just talking about pornography. I'm talking about gossip. I'm talking about slander. Fox News pops stuff up on my computer before I know it. I'm ticked at the world because I read those things. Or things that, oh, I like to have. That. Look at that. I want that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're distracting you from what your mind ought to be focusing on. Or when we spend most of our time with people who have different priorities than God does. We invite trouble because their priorities can become our priorities in the wink, the blink of an eye. Or when we spend all of our free time at home sitting in front of the, the television. We invite trouble because we're going to be absorbing the world's values instead of God's values. Now, I'm not telling you that television will send you to hell. I'm not. There are good things on television sometimes. But 
instead of inviting trouble in our downtime, I mean, everybody's got loads and tons of downtime, right? Where you just have nothing to do. No, but we have snippets where we can put good things in. Good things in, good things out. Garbage in, garbage out. For it is from the heart that man speaks and acts and behaves. Instead of inviting trouble, I challenge you to make time for, for things that will repel trouble. Start by making worship and Bible study a priority. Oh, there he goes. He's hitting on that again. I know y'all are getting tired of it, but why do I keep saying it week after week? It's because not everybody here is involved in a disciple study group. Not everybody in the world comes and worships every week. Worship and being part of a, of a discipling Bible study group is a must for a Christian. It's a must. Rather than spending hours in front of the television, do something productive. Read a good Christian book by a good Christian author. Yes, yeah, some of them read like insurance manuals, but a lot of them are really good reading. And they have short chapters where you can read 10 minutes and you've got insights to think about, godly things to dwell on for the rest of the day. When you're in your car, now, I love southern rock and roll music. I'm a child of the 80s. I love the big hair bands. I like all those things. And I listen to some of them sometimes. The preacher listens to rock and roll music. But I also listen to praise music. I listen to preaching I listen to focus on the family. I listen to things that are godly. And if I'm going on a road trip, I have to take some this week. I listen to uh, Willie George, Decoding Revelation. Great stuff. I listen to Max Licata. He still moves stones. You, you know, things that, that give me food for thought and help me. Make downtime work for you that way. Find a place to serve God. Maybe you can visit people who are hurting. Write letters or send cards or, or share your faith with people who are struggling. Or help teach a class that we need a teacher for. Find something that you can do that involves spending your time in devotion and service for God and others. <coughs> the key is that if we want to avoid temptation, we need to work at drawing close to God. Notice the operative word there. Work. Work at drawing close to God. If we don't work at developing our relationship with God, guess what? It's not going to develop. Think of it like, like marriage. If you neglect your relationship, we all, all of us who have been married, whether we want to admit it or not, there are times in our relationships where things cool off. And it reminds me of, of the old Bugs Bunny cartoon when the sheep watchers pass each other at shift change. Morning, Ralph. Morning, Sam. That's what our relationship comes to be. Morning, Katie. Morning, Dave. Night, Katie. You have to work at a relationship. <clears throat> you got to work at it. If you neglect your relationship, you're going to find that you hardly know the stranger that lives in the same house that you do. The key in marriage is to constantly work at developing your relationship, building it. It's the same with any relationship, and it's the same with your relationship with God. The more you learn about God, the better you're going to be able to live what God calls you to. The more you're going to love God because the more you're going to understand, man, this God, He, he really loves me. In spite of all my failures, God really does love me. And you're going to love Him more. You, you'll crave worship more. The more you get to know God, the more you will crave worshiping together with your brothers and sisters. The more that your, your relationship develops with God, the more you're going to want to drink in His Word the more you're going to be able to stand up when the world says, you know, the Bible says this, but that's not really what Jesus meant. 
I want to ask him, how in the world do you know what Jesus meant? Because I don't think you've ever met him. Because he didn't say that. Develop your relationship. Work at it. The more you learn about God, the better you'll be able to please God. The more you'll crave worship and the healthier your relationship with God will be. And if we put in that hard work of developing our relationship with God, if we put our focus on not just trying to avoid temptation, or not just avoid giving in to temptation, but instead of trying to do what God calls us to, it will prepare us to stand firm with Him. With Him. And with Him, both on the mountaintop and in the valley and in the wilderness and everywhere in between, there is no temptation that you cannot stand firm with God and defeat it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing our Lenten hymn this morning.